All right, guys, welcome to Chapter 9. Uh, well, we've already been in Chapter 9, but this is the last part of Chapter 9. So anyway, we're going to talk about moral issues in gene therapy. So um, gene therapy, uh, changing the DNA of the subject to make him um, not express or uh, express a gene product that is either causing them harm or they're missing, uh, which in turn is causing them harm. So uh, things that we will look for in informed consent, medical, medical risk and benefit of therapy, uh, duties to use the procedure to prevent suffering. So we shouldn't be increasing suffering um, by having patients in clinical trials. Um, we should be decreasing it. And um, one of the problems with uh, this statement is age. So many of the people who have these diseases that can be treated are young, very young. Uh, reproductive freedom and the morality of practicing positive genetics. So we'll get into all that. All right, so genetic screening. So some of you guys looked up genetic screening. Well, all of you should have. Um, but we have some some issues with it. So uh, there's a statement here, all there's curiosity to discover genetic risk. Maybe a genome testing. There's also a fear regarding genetic discrimination. Right, so it all comes to what we talked about. Who, who owns the data? <clears throat> if the insurance company pays, do they have a right to see the results? If your employer is paid, do they have a right to see them? And law enforcement, right? Can law enforcement use it uh, to put you on a genetic um, genetic risk list? So all those things we'll talk about. So because of that, in 2008, uh, GINA, the Genetic uh, Information Non-Discrimination Act, was formed. Um, and there's a couple titles to so it. Title one said health insurance. So if you have health insurance and you got you get screening, it says that your health insurance company cannot discriminate, right, uh, based on the results. So if I have screening and it shows I have a, um, a high risk for uh, severe cardiac disease, they can't increase my premiums or, or cut my coverage, right, uh, just because I know and they know. Of employment, if I'm employed, the employer cannot discriminate based on these results. So uh, this should uh, protect me with decisions such as hiring, firings, promotion, pay, and job assignments. The problem is it's not always easy to tell why they're not giving you a promotion, right, or a pay increase, or a change in job assignments. So uh, because, um, you know, things are variable, uh, there's some exceptions to Gina. So GINA does not apply to fewer. So if I have a small company, right, uh, less than 15 employees, and one of my employees has a genetic screening, and it comes out with something horrific, right, uh, I don't have to offer them long-term insurance or life insurance or disability insurance. Um, I can discriminate, basically, because if that person got sick, I don't have enough employees, I don't make enough money that my company can cover it. So like I say here, unfortunately, for a patient that uncovers the potential, right, uh, in the genetic screening, is the exact person who will probably need long-term insurance coverage or maybe life insurance or whatnot. Right, the, the code is actually right here. Um, so additionally, new Gina does not discriminate, uh, cover discrimination by insurance company regarding new applications. So if I have this screening and I change jobs, right, and I get insurance with a new job, they can discriminate. Right. Now, um, the Affordable Care Act, uh, which was put in by the previous um, presidential administration, uh, has protections against pre-existing conditions. Um, we'll have to see how the current landscape holds out. There are lawsuits with the Supreme Court right now to do away with that because they say it discriminates against insurance companies' ability to make money. Okay. Um, so, uh, also an exception, if you go to the website here and you read it, uh, military. If you have genetic screening, the military can discriminate on having you there based on your screen. Right? Because the military is a branch of the government and not the public sector. All right. So, wellness programs. So, your employer cannot require you to give genetic information, but they can offer wellness programs. Uh, our school district offers wellness programs. They say, come get a genetic screening, right? And we'll tell you your risk factors. And we'll also take some blood from you and your blood pressure and all that. Um, so, Gina, uh, it is permissible for employers to request genetic information, 
uh, but they cannot offer you money for it, and they cannot uh, penalize you for not giving it. I just say no. That's what I usually do. Um, if I want a genetic screening or a risk panel, I'll go to my family physician, right? That way, the medical information stays between me and my physician, and probably the insurance company because they pay for it, right? Or I can pay out of pocket, and my insurance company can never know, right? Um, in 2016, right, uh, your employer could also request that um, information from your spouse as well. And they could offer a premium reduction. Because remember, if they if, if they do this genetic screening and your spouse has a pre-existing condition, they cannot offer you long-term disability benefits, right? Or offer her long-term coverage under your family plan. So gene therapy, so we'll get to gene therapy. So gene therapy uh, is changing DNA, right? This is changing DNA. This is what we're doing. Okay, so um, uh, single gene mutations are the most common ones we try to um, we try to repair. Right? Uh, there's two different ways we look at it. Targets. There's somatic cells and germ cells. Uh, we try not to do germ cells because germ cells will affect the next generation. Uh, most clinical studies are done in a somatic cell insertion. So currently, there are not very many gene therapies approved. Um, right. So somatic cell insertion. All right. So remember, these are body cells. All right. These are body cells. Uh, DNA is inserted via viral vector that has been engineered to search up. So the viral vectors here most often it's a cold virus. Okay. So controlling the vector search. Insertion can be problematic. So many of these we fix. There's a cell. So cells inserted in culture are in vitro. Okay, so um, so many of those the cells inserted in culture are not a cell, say DNA is inserted in culture. Right, and then we'll grow a tissue culture and then we'll reimplant. So um, so we do this because it's often harmful because of the viral vector. Right? So viral vectors are not always specific, right? And we can't always control the gene product. So, well, a little bit of history. In 1990, right, uh, we first uh, approved a trial for ADA disease, right? So, ADA disease, what it does is um, it makes the T cells, the B cells, And the natural killer cells ineffective, uh, kind of like a blindfold, right? So, uh, with this, they did uh, cell implantation, right? Uh, for uh, cell reculture. So, they took hemopoietic cells, so uh, essentially bone marrow, right? And they genetically engineered them and then uh, re implanted them to have them produce normal, normal blood cells, right? So, first FTA. Um, so, Usually these kids died at very young uh, from opportunistic infections, um, had a very good success rate. But what they find is over time, the body's immune system starts to seek out and kill these, in, these implanted cells, right? So the life expectancy was about 20 years old, right? Uh, 
with the increasing therapy um, and then uh, reinsertion, hopefully it could last longer, but there are limited results. So, um, but that's our first one. 1999, uh, 18-year-old, uh, OTCD. So uh, these people with this rare disease uh, can't process um, uh, proteins well, right? And they start to produce ammonia within their body. They can't break it down, uh, and it's toxic. So a lot of people die uh, very young. So an 18-year-old with a very mild form of this disease who was treating it well with diet um, was coerced and volunteered for a study uh, and then had a, kind of a cytokine release syndrome uh, happen with it, and he died. And he got a lot of national attention, um, and the, the federal government put a halt to it. And they wanted to look at it because there were moral questions um, based on gene trials and, and who are the trial su subjects, right? Remember Helsinki said we need to protect the people who can't speak for themselves? And most of these people with these diseases are minors, right? So we put a halt to them. So it's, it's not that easy to get a, a gene trial done. So to this date, the FDA has only approved a small amount of gene therapies in clinical trials. Uh, spinal atrophy of the newborn was approved in 2019, which shows promise. Uh, ethical arguments rise from the AIDS, like I said, the horrific side effects of vector rejection. Uh, currently, 849 clinical studies have been underway. I think there are, like I said, 390-some active trials. And currently, 31 clinical studies using CRISPR. Remember, CRISPR is a gene replacing tool. All right. All right, gene replacement therapy. Uh, like I said, using CRISPR. So unlike gene insertion, uh, CRISPR uh, replaces it. But CRISPR has not been all, always that specific, but there are new forms of CRISPR out there you can, that, can, that have been engineered to replace a single nucleotide, which are showing promise. Right? Uh, risks come with, with gene editing, so whether it's in vivo in, in a person or in vitro in a culture. So most things are done in vitro. Uh, and I'll talk to you in our follow-up Zoom about uh, some of the other things that are going on right now. So currently there are 31 CRISPR research trials. So anyway, um, I will talk to you in the afternoon. Uh, and uh, have a good day.